Romans chapter 4, verses 9 through 17. Put it up on the screen for those in the house of the Lord. Romans chapter 4, verses 9 through 17. Read in this fashion from the King James text. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also. For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also and the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision also but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham which he had being yet uncircumcised for the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect. Because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, verse 17, Romans 4, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. Hallelujah. Call me Ishmael. If you bow your heads with me one more moment, Master, once again, God, we come before the throne of grace boldly as the word of God declares. It is our privilege as children of God. We need the anointing of the Holy Ghost to rest upon the speaker today. I have no skill, I have no gift nor talent that I might offer the people of God. I have only my willingness to yield to the Holy Ghost that you might use me this hour as your oracle, your mouthpiece to declare to the people of God the Word of God which is able to bring salvation which is able to bring healing and restoration, which is able to bring deliverance, O oh Lord, which is able to restore joy and peace. Master, in the name of Jesus, anoint every ear of every hearer. I believe this word is an important word. Anoint the ear of every hearer. Lord, that we that hear might receive with gladness the engrafted word of God. Let this not fall upon our hearing only, but rather, O oh God, let it find its way to the deepest crevice of our heart, that the word of God might affect change in us. Lord, that it might cause us 
to grab hold of this faith and never let go. Master, in the name of Jesus, we ask all this. Amen. Praise God and amen. The Apostle Paul goes to great lengths in Romans chapter 4 basically to make a very simple point. He said, was Abraham viewed as righteous before God, before or after he had performed the seal of the covenant he had with the Lord, that seal being the act of circumcision. The Lord told Abraham that he and all his male descendants were to be circumcised and that this was a sign of the covenant that God had made with Abraham. And yet the Apostle Paul asked the question, he said, was Abraham accounted righteous before God? before circumcision or after circumcision. He said the truth is he was accounted righteous before circumcision. And the circumcision then was only a sign and a seal of the righteousness which had already, already, already been imputed unto him by God. That is the soul the whole sum of what we just read in Romans chapter 4, verses 9 through 17. Took all those words for Paul to make this point. He said this is why Abraham was told by God that he would be the father of many nations. He said this was possible. Now mind you, the whole point of circumcision was to identify and to set apart the singular nation of Israel. And yet God told Abraham that he would be the father of many nations. So obviously the circumcision act was not an act that created the body of descendants that God had promised Abraham. No, what created the body of descendants who would come after Abraham, the Apostle Paul said, is the faith that Abraham had in God that caused him then to be circumcised going to tell you a little secret today my friend. According to the word of God, the like figure whereunto baptism doth also now save us. Baptism in water in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins is the new Testament circumcision. Hallelujah. That is the way that we are identified as a descendant of Abraham. That is the way we are identified as a member of the body of Christ. That is the way we are identified as a member of God's adopted family. For as many of us as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. My word. So baptism is the New Testament circumcision. But what comes first, first before baptism? Faith. Mm -hmm. Amen. The faith doesn't come after the baptism. No, the faith comes after we believe. Amen. After we have embraced and believed the gospel. Then comes the seal of that faith. Then comes the act that James, the brother of Jesus, talks about in James chapter 2. When he said faith without works, faith without action is dead being alone. Abraham believed. How do we know he believed? He was circumcised and he circumcised all of his male children. That's how we know he believed because he followed through and did what God asked him to do. 
That is why Jesus said in Mark chapter 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Why? Because baptism is the prescribed act of obedience that we do in response to our initial faith. But faith without action is dead being alone. But where do we put our faith? What is our faith in? I'll tell you, when it comes to salvation, I told you last Sunday, the Word of God said, For there is no other name given among men under heaven, whereby we must be saved. The Word of God said, To them gave He power to become the sons of God. Listen, even them who believe on His name. Where is our faith? Our faith is in the name of Jesus Christ. Why? Because the name of Jesus Christ identifies our God and the lengths to which He went in order to bring us salvation. Mm -hmm. Jehovah has become our salvation. That's what Jesus means. When we're baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, we are baptized in the name of Jehovah, our Savior. Hallelujah. Oh my God, have mercy. I remember a fella in the church I grew up in, Sam, bless his heart. He's a little odd fella. Back in the day, he's a little strange. <laughs> but he had a way sometimes. He loved the Lord, and, and he really did, and he tried real hard, but he could just say and do some strange things sometimes. But one Sunday, I remember him testifying, and he said, I had some people come to my door the other day, he said, and they knocked on my door, and they were trying to sell me on their religion. He said, I asked them, well, who are you with? What are you? And they said, oh, well, you know, we're, we're uh, followers of Jehovah. And he said, I looked at them and said, oh, wonderful. So am I. Come on in. <laughs> those who know what Jesus means, those who know who Jesus was, know that we too are followers of Jehovah. Hallelujah. We follow Jehovah straight into the waters of baptism. Hallelujah. We're baptized in his name. Glory to God. There's Jehovah Jireh. There's God. He's God my provider. There's Jehovah Shalom. He's God my peace. There's Jesus Yeshua. He's Jehovah my Savior. Hallelujah. Oh my God have mercy. Baptism is today what circumcision was in the Old Testament. It is an act of obedience and faith that follows our initially believing the gospel. And that is how we are initiated or inducted into the family of God through baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. Abraham is the father then of not only those who have been circumcised into the Jewish identity and the Jewish faith and the Jewish nationality, but he is also the father of all those who would come later and embrace by faith the gospel. Why? Because that's how his journey began. It began with faith. Everything was about faith. There's no obedience except there's first faith. You're not going to do something somebody tells you if you don't believe what they're telling you to do. Am I telling the truth? I've used this example many times. If somebody runs in the building right now and they're yelling, fire, fire, get out of the building, the building's on fire. If you don't believe that person, if that person's staggering drunk and they come popping in here and say, the building's on fire, you know the building's on fire. I, I want to tell you all, I'm going to burn up because this building's on fire. You might look at him and think, oh, for crying out loud, he's out of his mind, he's out of his wits. He doesn't know what he's saying. And you might just stay right where you're at. But if somebody comes in wearing a fireman's suit, uh-oh, if he comes in wearing a fireman's outfit 
And he said, folks, the mill is on fire. You need to get out of here. Boy, out of here, you're going to get up and move, aren't you? Why? Because you believe the fire. Mm -hmm. He looks the part. He looks like he knows what he's talking about. That's somebody who ought to be able to trust him. I tell the truth. Same thing with a policeman or some other uh, civic authority. Faith breeds obedience. You don't obey without first believing. You're not baptized. You know, some people think, well, I'll just hedge my bets. Just in case heaven's real, just in case God's real, I'll go ahead and get baptized. Just in case. Well, honey, guess what? All that happens to you is you get wet. Well, but I was baptized in Jesus' name. That don't matter. All you're going to do is get wet. Well, how come? How come that other person gets baptized in Jesus' name and their sins are remitted? And you're saying, I get baptized to hedge my bets just in case. And all I do is get wet. Well, it's easy because it's through faith in his name that we are sealed unto the day of redemption. It's through faith in his name that salvation is imparted unto us. If you don't have faith in his name, you're just trying to hit your bets. <laughs> you're just taking a bath with your clothes on. Moby Dick is an 1851 novel by the American writer Herman Melville. The book is the sailor Ishmael's narrative of a quest that he embarked upon, uh, uh, that a captain embarked upon. Uh, the captain's name was Ahab. Ahab was the captain of a whaling ship by the name of the Pequod. And Ahab was on this maniacal venture seeking vengeance against Moby Dick, the giant white sperm whale that bit off his leg on the ship's previous voyage. It famously begins with the words, Call me Ishmael. Ishmael is a name which has been associated uh, for centuries and eons with a castaway or a wanderer, a rebel of sorts, who must fight his way through life. In our primary text today, we see that the Lord our God, listen, is always ahead of the curve. He does not always see or speak in the present. Time is of little consequence to the Lord. He is not bound by the hands on a clock, nor is he affected by the setting of the sun. The earth's rotation around the sun has no effect upon him whatsoever. As human beings, however, all we do is subject to time. We are unable to escape the captivity of time or the ravages of its passing. But God, who knows the end from the beginning and sees the future as clearly as the present, speaks from a place, listen, of constant and absolute certainty. He doesn't always speak in the present tense. God doesn't live always in the moment. He doesn't live in the present. See, we're confined to time. God is not. Sometimes God speaks and what he's saying hadn't happened yet. But when God says it, it's as good as done. It's going to happen. He knows it's going to happen. He has spoken it. And God doesn't talk just to hear his own voice. Hallelujah. And therefore he is able to say today what is not yet realized fact. And yet it is as good as done. Our primary text today ended with verse 17, Romans chapter 4. As it is written, 
I have made thee a father of many nations. And I'm going to read that to you in a moment from the book of Genesis. Before him whom he believed, meaning God said this to Abraham, even God who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. <laughs> See, sometimes God says things that hadn't yet happened, but he doesn't say this will be the case or this is going to happen. No, he says, I've done this. Well, Lord, what are you talking about? You've done it. I'm still sitting here. Sarah's still barren. I still have no heir but Ishmael. You're telling me you're going to give me a child through Sarah. She hadn't had no babies. How is it you're telling me I won't be the father of many nations? Everything you're telling me seems conflicted with the facts. Am I telling the truth? Everything you're saying seems to conflict with what I'm seeing around me. Nothing matches what you're saying. You're speaking as though it's already done. But the fact of the matter is, nothing has changed. Oh my God, have mercy. I might just get a little bit Pentecostal on you today. I'm here to tell you, I want you to hear me today, children. If there is any truth, if there is any doctrine, if there is anything that the church today has screwed up royally and messed up royally, it is this truth and this fact. God calls those things which be not as though they were. Hallelujah. Every song we sing, every prayer we pray, every declaration we make, the word of the Lord said, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Got news for you. Not one soul has been redeemed yet. Redemption comes at the moment of resurrection. Redemption will come at the time of the rapture. The word of God said that is when the Lord will redeem, will redeem, will redeem his purchased possession. But we sing the old song. Oh, I'm redeemed by joy divine, by love divine. Oh, glory, glory, Christ is mine. We sing these old songs. We declare ourselves to be redeemed. We sing, saved by his power divine, saved to new life sublime. Life now is sweet and my joy is complete, for I'm saved, saved, saved. No, you're not, no, you're not, no, you're not. But you are, but you are, but you are by faith. People, Tommy, they read stuff in the Word of God. They read certain things that some of the apostles say, and they fail to understand that everything a believer speaks in the present concerning righteousness and holiness, redemption and salvation is by faith. Mm -hmm. Everything. Mm -hmm. The same apostle who said, if we say that we have no sin, we make God a liar and the truth is not in us. The same exact apostle, the apostle John, the same exact one, not a chapter away, says <laughs> that if we're born of God, we don't sin. Contradiction. Oh, contradiction. We have people who read the Bible 
and they'll tell you to say, oh, the Bible's full of contradiction. And Christians will try to say, oh, no, it's not. Oh, yes, it is. Don't kid yourself, believer. You can stand here and play that theological mind game all you want to play. You can stand here and try to, try to twist and pervert things all you want to. There are numerous contradictions in the Word of God. The only problem is they're really not contradictions. <laughs> now you say, now preacher, now you're talking in circles. Now you're talking out of both sides of your mouth. No, no. Not when you understand that our God calls those things which be not as though they were. When you're born of God, you cannot sin. Well, when we are born again in the rapture, when we are born again in the resurrection, when this body shall put on immortality and this corruptible shall put on incorruptible, guess what? We will no longer be subject to sin. Hallelujah. But we say today what we have not yet realized, but we say it by faith. Hallelujah. Because we believe the promise of God. The same way that Abraham believed the promise of God. And he followed through in his faith through the act of uh, circumcision. Even so, the believer today believes the promise of God for salvation and follows through with the act of water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. Oh, hallelujah. Call me Ishmael. That's how Moby Dick starts out. Call me Ishmael. It's about Ahab. But he said, you know, I identify with this wanderer. I identify with this rebel. I identify with this guy who had to fight in his life for everything that he had. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? So call me Ishmael. Let's read Genesis 17, 1 3. And when Abraham was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect, and I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations, listen, have I made thee? He didn't say, I will make you. He said, have I? He's talking past tense. I, I've already done this. I will, and I will make thee exceeding fruitful. And I will make nations of thee. And kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. Through an angel of the Lord, the Lord God instructed Abraham and Sarah to name the child who is to be born of Hagar, Sarah's servant woman, Ishmael. You see, Sarah had been barren. She had borne Abraham no children. And she felt as though perhaps she could do God and Abraham a favor. 
by bringing another party into the equation. And she brought in Hagar, and Hagar became Abraham's second wife. Oh my, you people who want to stand there and lie like a rug and tell me that marriage has always been between one man and one woman. You are the biggest fib and pile of poop I've ever seen in my life. You're the biggest liars on the face of the planet. Abraham, the father of the Jewish faith, had two wives, honey. And the child that was to be born of Hagar, the Lord instructed his name is to be called Ishmael. You know what's interesting about the name Ishmael? Ishmael means, listen to this, the Lord will hear. Not the Lord has heard, the Lord will hear. Abraham and Sarah were barren. God made a covenant with Abraham. His intention was that this covenant would be the, uh, the uh, offspring of Abraham and Sarah. That was the covenant God made with Abraham when Abraham had one wife, Sarah. There was no hater in the picture at the time. Now, they decide they're going to do God a favor. I'm going to tell you something. There are a lot of dingbat people in America call themselves Christians today who think they're doing God a favor. They think they can add to what God can do and what God can't do. We need to change the laws about abortion in order for uh, people's behavior to change concerning abortion. No, you don't. Oh, you don't. Let me tell you something. God could bring revival to this nation, and God could cause abortions to practically fall off the edge of the map, and very few of them to ever take place, and very few of them to ever happen if we would do things His way. Oh, but no, we've got to jump in, and we've got to do things carnally. We've got to do things our own way to help God along, because after all, God ain't moving fast enough. Honey, this kind of behavior goes back to antiquity. Abraham and Sarah. Sarah thought she was doing the Lord a favor by bringing Hagar in. The only problem is that was not God's plan. That was not how God intended that his promise should be fulfilled. Lord, I'm going to tell you something. We mess more things up when we try to do things for God. If we let God genuinely do it, people say, yes, but God's the one who changed the law in America. It was God who helped us to change. You peon. And God had nothing to do with it. God had, nobody looks at that and can, uh, no unbeliever looks at that and says, oh, the reason the law was changed is because God did it. But I'll tell you what, you let God do it, and I guarantee you, people will look at it and say, well, how in the world did this even happen? How in the world did this even transpire? Amen. Because when God does it, you know God did it. The problem is we got people trying to do for God Oh, my Lord, have mercy. And God is not glorified when we try to do for Him. No, it has to be done His way. His covenant was to be carried out in the manner that He prescribed. So listen. So the Lord instructed that the child born of Hagar should be called the Lord will hear. See, they had prayed and hoped and wanted a child and then they thought they'd help God along so they brought Hagar in and here comes the little baby and the Lord said, call him Ishmael. Why? Because I will hear you. Oh my God, have mercy. Is this child the realization of my hearing from you? No. But I will hear. Oh, was like, Hallelujah. No, this baby is not God hearing from me. This is not the answer that God has said. This is not God's provision. Do you hear what I'm telling you? But God will hear you. <laughs> oh, my Lord. I'm going to tell you, the Lord plants these little messages. 
Oh, there's importance to names in, in God. God is very thoughtful when it comes to names. Every name is to speak basically the greatest truth in the life of the individual that bears that name. The name Ishmael means the Lord will hear. From the start, the Lord did not accept Ishmael as the legitimate descendant and heir of Abraham. Ishmael was not to be the heir to the promise of God. Now, Ishmael was, in fact, the firstborn son of Abraham. But he was not the right one. Do you remember a story later in Scripture concerning two brothers born to Jacob, uh, excuse me, to Isaac, Esau, and Jacob? Which of those brothers wound up being elevated and became the heir to the promise and heir to the covenant? The second one, Jacob. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. Do you see a pattern here? Israel and the church. <laughs> the firstborn is Israel, and the second is the church. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Oh, I want to tell you today, listen to me, children. The Lord told Abraham that he would have a child, a son, while he was with and married only to his wife, Sarah. The child who was to be born through Sarai was to be the legitimate heir of the covenant God made with Abraham. It was imperative that the child, listen, it was imperative that the child born of Sarai be the avenue through which the Lord worked as it was God's plan that all future descendants would be recognized as Jews or heirs to Abraham, heirs to the covenant, based upon their birth mother and not their father. Abraham's descendants for all of time were going to be determined not by who fathered them, but by who their mother was. Oh my goodness. My goodness. This was the means God used to establish a precedent which in the future would allow his promised Messiah <laughs> to be born of a woman <laughs> and thus to be counted among the people of Israel. Oh, hallelujah. Woo, all the way back in the beginning when God made his covenant with Abraham and with Sarah. He already had it all lined up. He already had it all set up so that when the time came that Messiah came into the world, he could be born a Jew. Why? Because Jewish heritage is determined by the birth of mother, not the father. Why is that, do you suppose? Well, I'll tell you why. Because Jerry Springer made an entire living off of Aaron People's dirty laundry on television. He and Maury Povich. And we've got, he is the father. He is not the father. Oh, but look at him, Maury. He looks just like him. He looks just like him. And then Maury reads the paper. He is not the father. Why Why did God choose that the, uh, the uh, heritage of a child would be determined by the birth mother and not the father? Because the father can be uncertain. The father can be questioned, especially in biblical times, you know, uh, they had no DNA, they had no testing, they didn't understand blood type, they didn't know how these things work, but instead, it was always through the birth mother. Why? Because the birth mother was never in question. Mm -hmm. You always know who the birth mother is. 
Amen. You can lie about it. You can tell stories about it. But the fact remains that a child born of a woman is that, is that woman's child. Period. End of the story. So already, even as the Lord made his covenant with Abraham, he was laying the groundwork for Calvary. Hallelujah. Knowing that the Christ was to have no earthly father, it was imperative that Jewish identity be based upon the nationality of the mother and not the father. Oh my goodness. He was also to be born into the household and the lineage of King David, the psalmist. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was also from the house and lineage of David, as was her husband Joseph, as she descended from David's son, Nathan. The lineage of Joseph and the lineage of Mary match with the same names from Abraham all the way to David. What does that mean? That means that Joseph and Mary were distant cousins. <laughs> oh my goodness. Genesis 17, 15 through 22. And God said unto Abraham, as for Sarai, thy wife, up until now she was known as Sarai, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. And I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nation. Kings of people shall be of her. Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is an hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? And Abraham said unto God, Listen, all that Ishmael might live before thee, he said, why don't you just accept Ishmael as my rightful heir? Why don't you just accept Ishmael as the one and let him be heir to the promise and the covenant that you and I have made together? And God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed. And thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and his seed after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. And he, meaning the Lord, left off talking with him, meaning Abraham, and God went up from Abraham. The Lord establishes the precedent which states that the lineage of Abraham is determined by the mother of the child, not the father. A child born to a Jewish mother is Jewish, no matter what the nationality of the father. A father's factual parentage can always be called into question, but a mother's cannot. Even when we do not know who the father is, the mother is always biologically fact and undeniable. God had made a promise and a covenant with Abraham while he was married to Sarai, or who became Sarah. He and they thought they'd give the Lord, excuse me, they thought they'd give the Lord a helping hand by causing Abraham to take a second wife, an Egyptian servant of Sarah's named Hagar 
who quickly became pregnant and bore Abram a son whom they named Ishmael. A, excuse me, Ishmael was not the realization of God's promise to Abraham. Isaac was the realization of that promise. Ishmael was the carnal attempt by Abraham and Sarah to ensure the lineage of Abraham did not die with him. But he was not the son whom God had already chosen to use for this purpose. You see, Abraham and Sarah hadn't even had any children. Remember what I said about God doesn't always speak in the present? He's not bound by time. He's not always in the present. No, he's looking at them and saying, oh, no, 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 no. no. Y'all already have a son. His name is Isaac. Lord, we don't have no son. We don't have any kids. That's why we went and got Hagar in on this so we could have us a kid. Lord said, oh, no, 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 no. In my sight, you have a son. In my sight, I made a covenant with you while you were married to Sarah, and my promise was between you and Sarah having a child. I don't care how impossible it looked. I don't care how difficult it looked. I don't care how hard it looked. I'm trying to tell you I'm God, honey. And if I want an old man and an old woman to have a baby, they're going to have a baby. My Lord, have mercy. Do you understand how God works? Do you understand now when we get up and sing songs about salvation and redemption, when we get up and sing songs about holiness and righteousness, when we get up and sing songs, when we read passages in the Scripture, a lot of times, many of the passages we read, we ought to be reading with the understanding that God calls those things which be not as though they were. There's so much confusion in the Christian church because people read passages in Scripture that say things like, a believer cannot sin. Well, honey, if a believer cannot sin, then there's not a believer on the face of planet Earth. Hello now. A child of God cannot sin. How can we sin if we've been... Um, uh, John said, if we've been born again, you know, of, uh, of God's lineage and God's heritage, how can we then say if we're born of that lineage? But as believers, God calls those things which be not as though they were. Oh, I'm going to tell you, you may be a sinner. You may be faulty. You may be frail. Oh, you may have your faults. You may have your weaknesses. You may have your issues. Mm. But God says, you're holy. God says, you're perfect. God says, you're mine. God says, you're my child. God says, you're heaven ready. Hallelujah, glory to God. Because God calls those things which be not as though they were. Hallelujah. Sometimes okay, Isaac was the realization of the promise that God made to Abraham. Ishmael was the carnal attempt by Abraham and Sarah to ensure that his lineage did not die with him. But he was not the son of that God had already chosen to use for this purpose. Because in God's timetable, in God's eternity, he already saw Isaac. Isaac was already part of the equation. Do you follow what I'm saying? Oh, this is an important lesson to learn, folks. This is something most Christians don't get. This is what causes so much conflict in the church. This is what causes moronic Christian people to tell LGBT believers they cannot be saved and they cannot be a Christian and they cannot serve God when in fact they can. Hallelujah. Because honey, they know one of us that doesn't break the rules or break the law that God established with Moses on Mount Sinai at some point or at some level in our life. If you may not be a whoremonger. You may not be a drunkard. You may not be a drug addict. You may not be a prostitute. You may not 
uh, do many of the things that you think are big on the list, but you're a gossip, but you're malicious, but you're a liar. Mm -hmm. Oh, my Lord, but you're a thief. Oh, but pastor, if there are those things, there's no way in the universe they're going to make it into heaven. Really? That's funny because the Apostle Paul says in one place, he said, you criticize and talk about those who do all these things. Listen to me now. Listen to me now. Listen to me now. You got you got to see this is what I mean. People just don't let the word of God say what it says. Paul said, you've got plenty to say about these people who do all these things. He said, but you do the same things. What? What, Paul? You were just talking about all these sinful things that unbelievers do. And then you turn around and tell the church you're writing to that they're doing the same identical things. Yeah. The difference is our faith is accounted unto us for righteousness. And therefore, God calls those things which be not as though they were. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do you understand what I'm telling you today? This is one of the most important lessons you will ever learn. Psalm 132 and verse 11. I love this passage. I love this passage because it establishes as clear as a bell that Messiah is to be none other than Jehovah God himself. The Lord hath sworn in truth unto David. He will not turn from it. Of the fruit of thy body will I set upon thy throne. Why? Did the lineage of Abraham have to be determined by the mother? Because when Messiah came, he would be God manifest in the flesh. The only father that baby knows is Almighty God, who is the Spirit, by the way. And that Spirit, the Word of the Lord said, was in Christ, reconciling the world unto him Hallelujah. The Apostle Paul said, Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified or perfect in spirit. Why? Because the flesh is one thing and the spirit is something else. The spirit in the man Jesus Christ was nothing else but God. That is the only spirit that occupied the man Jesus Christ. Thus, he had a dual identity. He was both man and simultaneously he was God. But in order for God to inhabit a body, in order for God to manifest himself to humanity in the flesh and to be counted among the Jewish people and to be counted as a descendant of David then he had to start with Abraham and make all the descendants of Abraham be determined by the birth mother. Do you follow? Boy, I'm going to tell you, you see how beautifully God puts things together? Nothing. That, that's why I say, when people say things to me about, you know, the Bible, it's just a book. It was just written by men. <laughs> Honey, if, if, you, if you study this thing and realize how intricate it is and how amazingly, powerfully uh, complex it is, it was written by dozens of authors over the course of many centuries. Nobody could put this together the way that it's put together except the divine. Hallelujah. In Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, and it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. 
And this texting was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to the text, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. Well, that's all wonderful that the Lord's adopted dad was of the house and lineage of David. But lineage is determined by the mother. Well, guess what? Mary and he were distant cousins <laughs> going back some generations. And therefore, my friend, she too was a descendant of David. Listen, I'm, I'm trying to pull this thing together and bring it to a close. I'm going long, aren't I? Ephesians 1, 3 through 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Before the world was even formed, God knew you'd be sitting here this Sunday. Before the world was even formed, God knew you'd be watching this broadcast right now. Before the world was even formed, God knew you'd be listening and watching this video. Oh my Lord, have mercy. Listen, that we should be holy and without blame. Here are the two most important words in this passage. Before him in love. What does that mean? That means in his sight. That's how he sees us. Hallelujah. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Or he's made us accepted as part of the family. Romans 3.20 Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified listen to the words in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Doesn't say no man uh, uh, by the deeds of the law shall, that shall no flesh be justified, period. No. In his sight, he sees no one that's justified by the deeds of the law. Do you follow what I'm telling you? Now watch, Colossians 1, 21 through 23. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable. Here come those three words. In his sight. If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. The true test of our faith is the ability to trust the Lord and take Him at His word, listen to me children, in spite of what we see in the natural. Adam's failure was in the fact that he trusted what he saw and not the promise or the warning of God. Read Genesis 3 and 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, 
She took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. So Adam's failure was in what? He trusted what he saw versus what God had said. So salvation comes the opposite. We've got to trust what he says over what we see. Oh my God, have mercy. And in order to trust what we, he has promised like Abraham did, and therefore for, to that faith to be accounted unto us for righteousness, See, by trusting what God said, rather than with, I'm a, I'm a sinful, failure-filled person. I, I've got faults of the yin-yang. But I can say, I'm saying that I know that I am. I'm saying, and I know that I am. Well, I'm saying, and I know that I am. I'm so glad I know that I am. Oh, yes. I'm so glad I know that I am. How can I sing that? Because of my faith. And that faith is what makes me righteous. So that when God looks at me in his sight, oh, my God, I am holy and I am unreprovable. Oh, hallelujah to God. What makes me holy and unreprovable is not the length of my hair or the length of my pants or, lady, uh, how long your skirt is or whether you wear clothes close toed shoes or not what makes you holy and righteous and ready for heaven in the sight of God is not what you can see with the naked eye but it is rather what you believe if you can trust God and take him in his promise his promise to me is in spite of myself in spite of whatever inherited faults or failings or, or weaknesses I may have, in spite of my inability to live up to a standard of perfection, the fact is I can trust the promise of God. And trusting the promise of God is accounted unto me for righteousness. How do I know this? I'm going to finish up with these last few passages. Romans 1.17 For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. The righteousness of God, listen, is revealed from faith to faith. In other words, the righteousness of God is achieved through faith. It's not achieved through actions. It's not achieved through deeds. It is achieved through faith. So every single day we keep believing God. And every single day God looks at us and says, You are righteous. You are holy. You are unreprovable in my sight. Hallelujah. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Romans 3.22 Even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. Hallelujah. For there is no difference. Galatians 5 and 5. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Philippians 3, 9 through 14, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dumb, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Listen. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. So he's not talking about it like it's a for sure, absolute, yep, it's a definite thing. Paul said, if, if, if I'm able to get there to the resurrection of the dead. 
He then says in verse 12, Philippians 3, Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. He said, I don't consider myself as having achieved it. I don't consider myself as having gotten there. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, Forget your failure yesterday. Forget your cussing spree yesterday. Forget your temper tantrum yesterday. Forget your foolishness yesterday. And reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. This is where the holiness movement has tortured the word of God and made a passage from God's word say something it does not say. When the word of God says, follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. They tell you that without holiness, you can't see the Lord. That is not what the Apostle Paul said. The Apostle Paul said, if you do not pursue both things, peace with all men and holiness, if that is not your ultimate objective, if that is not your ultimate goal, you'll never see the Lord. People have lived their lives and people have called themselves Christians, but they just live their lives and they really don't have a hunger. They really don't have a desire in their heart. I can't wait till the day that I'm redeemed. I can't wait for the day when I can look Jesus in the eye and see him face to face because I am no longer what I am today. I can't wait for that day. I look forward to that day. I embrace that day by faith. Hallelujah. Because that is my ultimate end. That is my ultimate goal. I want to tell you, God calls those things which be not as though they were. My Lord, have mercy. Lastly, in closing, I love this passage today. This, this I've said many times, this is my favorite verse in the entire Word of God. And if I... Uh, if, if Tommy can afford to put it on my tombstone, I would love to have it on my tombstone because this verse says everything that's in my heart. Psalm 17, verse 15. As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. Hallelujah. In the meantime, our God calls those things which be not as though they were. Hallelujah. Call me Ishmael. <laughs> Hallelujah.